Welcome to the Web Platform Podcast, a developer discussion that dives deep into all things web. We discuss topics relevant to developing for the modern web and the web platform of today, tomorrow, and beyond. This is the Web Platform Podcast, episode number 96, DevOps and Chef. I am your host this week, Danny Blue, and with me is Leon Revel. Hi, everyone. And we have a very special guest today um, from Chef, Nathan Harvey. Hey, how's it going? Awesome. Uh, thanks, thank you, Nathan, for, for coming on and, and talking with us. If you, if Everybody can't tell from the title, we want to talk about um, DevOps predominantly and uh, specifically about about Chef. And um, so just real quick, can you tell us you know, a, a little bit about yourself, um, what you do at Chef, you know, who you are, what you do, what you like, all that business? Yeah, sure thing. So uh, as you mentioned, my name is Nathan Harvey. Uh, my title is VP of Community Development at Chef. Um, and I often get asked, like, what does that even mean? Uh, so I will tell you that uh, one thing that it means, one bit that's uh, absolutely true, is my code no longer runs in production, so we can all sleep a little easier at night. I can't say that that's always been the case, so uh, so that's it's, it's kind of a comforting thing. Um, but as a community manager or someone in charge of community development, it's really my job to go out and sort of fuel and spread the love of Chef and, and DevOps generally. Uh, I think that you know, Chef is definitely a tool that gets used by many people that are practicing DevOps, uh, but the two are not you know, linked necessarily. Uh, you can absolutely do DevOps without Chef. You can do Chef without DevOps. Uh, like The two don't necessarily go together. But as that community manager, I go out and I speak at a lot of conferences. I help organize meetups and support others that are organizing meetups. I do training classes and I do podcasts. In fact, I have my own podcast called The Food Fight Show, uh, which is all about DevOps and Chef. Cool. That's a really good answer to that question. Um, so just to step back a little bit then, you said that DevOps and Chef aren't exactly, don't exactly go in hand in hand. Could you describe a little bit kind of what DevOps is, kind of why does it exist, um, you know, and what kind of problems it has and things like that? Yeah, sure. So in my mind, DevOps is a cultural and professional movement focused on how we build and operate high-velocity organizations, and it's born from the experiences of its practitioners. So if we kind of take that definition and break it down a little bit, it's a cultural and professional movement. DevOps is not a tool. It's not something that you go and buy, although, uh, to be honest, you will find many people that will try to sell you DevOps. Uh, let me be clear, it's not something that you can buy. Um, oh, yes, I'll have some DevOps, please. Yes, exactly. <laughs> would you like 42 units or only 36? How many DevOps would you like today? Um, but it is focused on how we build and operate high-velocity organizations. So if you go back to sort of the, the very early beginnings of DevOps, it was kind of formed around this idea that uh, if we look at how code or applications move from the development process into the production environment where customers can actually take advantage of those applications, a lot of times what you saw was that the development teams were sort of incentivized to build new features and get those new features shipped out as quickly as possible. Whereas on the operations side of the house, the operators are, are incented and asked to keep the systems up and running and stable. So if you think about the, the two different sides of that equation, right, they're almost at odds with one another. The best way to keep things stable is to say, nope, no change, right? So the operations department becomes the department of no, like we're here to stop you from changing the systems. And th so now we're fighting against one another. So DevOps really was born from this philosophy and this idea that what we need to do is not fight against each other, but we need to have empathy for one another, and we need to remember that the reason that we're here, again, is to build that high-velocity organization or to deliver value to our customers. We need to work together to make that happen. Uh, very cool. That same as Leon said before. I, I think that's a very, very good answer for that. Um, I do think it is important. As funny as it, as it sounds, I do think it is important to... to to specify why DevOps is is not a, a, a thing, as it were, it, it is much of a mindset. You don't have to buy software. You don't have to, you don't have to use software really to do DevOps. It's 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 about your process, and then there are these different tools that you can use to make it, to make it work. Now, we are the Web Platform Podcast. Almost, I would say, predominantly, most of our listeners are are web are web developers, um, largely in the front end. Is there should like so, I'm I'm a front end developer. It, should I care 
as a front end developer ab about DevOps, or is, is this something for for the back end and the systems guys to worry about? Yeah, this is a, this is a really great great question, and, and it kind of goes to I think what is a, a general misunderstanding of the term itself. So if we go back to my definition, it's about building a high velocity organization. So as a front end web developer, do you care about building a high velocity organization? More specifically, do you care that the the code that you're writing and the features that you're building into your applications, do you care that they land in front of a customer? I would imagine that the answer to that is probably yes, right? Like it's cool to look at the the awesome front end stuff you've done on your laptop. But frankly, the only people that care about that are probably you. Maybe one or two other designers that you can also get to crowd around your laptop, but that doesn't really matter. None of the applications that we build matter until we put them in the hands of our customers. And on, on the back end side, right, if you take it from a sysadmin's perspective or an operations perspective, the same thing can be said, right? If I spend a week building out an incredible data center or months building out an incredible data center and we run no applications there, Nobody cares, right? And so you really, uh, as a front-end web dev, I think what you should be concerned with is how quickly do the changes that I'm making, the, the features that I'm introducing to the application, how quickly can they flow through the system and actually start delivering value to the business? And that's what DevOps is all about. Cool. Um, just to add a little bit more clarity, would you be able to give us an example of a, a web DevOps flow you know, that kind of applies to the front-end development team? Yeah, sure. So I think that if we think about like how do how do your applications move, say, or the changes that you make move, say, from your laptop into the production environment. Let's just walk through a scenario where that happens, right? So first and foremost, uh, I would expect that you are checking your changes into some sort of version control repository. Uh, so proper version control is, again, DevOps isn't a tool, but there are many tools that you'll encounter and many practices that you'll encounter as we look at DevOps in a flow. So uh, version control system is kind of step zero. Like if you, don't, if you aren't storing your code in a proper version control system, uh, you're not really ready for any of the other things that I'm going to talk about. So you must, must start there. And by the way, my, my definition, my criteria for a proper version control system, I'll, I'll, I'll lay out what those are. Uh, it, actually, I just lied. It's not criteria, it's criterion. Uh, as long as it starts with GIT, it's a proper version control system in my yeah. mind. There you go. I like it. All right. <laughs> so, so you start with version control system, right? Uh, and when you have a change to make, you're going to take that change, and it's, it's not just you working on the applications. You work with a team of people that are responsible for those applications and moving those applications through to production. So when you commit your code to a version control system, you're then going to submit that change to the rest of your team. Well, as part of submitting that change, there are a couple of things I think that are required. First, you have to have some automated testing built around those changes that you're doing, right? And so those tests must be uh, automatically executed for each change that you submit, and at least some portion of those tests. For example, the, the syntax checking, your linting, your unit tests are probably run immediately uh, probably locally on your machine if you're following good practices, but certainly before anyone else actually looks at it. From there, I think the next thing that happens is that you actually have code review with your peers. So another engineer should look at the code that you've written and decide, you know, is, does the code that Leon has written, does it look good? Is it following our internal practices? Is it, is it okay? Do we feel confident that we understand what's happening here so that we can support it down the line? And when that's the case, then that code should be merged immediately into your master branch, right? So now we introduce this, uh, so we've kind of introduced two concepts here, or three concepts. First, that we store our code and version control. Second, that we do some automated testing. Third, that we do code reviews. Fourth, that we do uh, continuous integration back into the master branch. And from there, it sh that code or that change should continue to flow through your organization where in uh, an acceptance environment, you might call it staging or pre-prod, I don't know what you call it. We'll call it an acceptance environment because uh, that's the word that I picked. Uh, but an acceptance environment gets created and that new code gets deployed there. So then you have questions around, well, how did that acceptance environment come into being? Like, how was it instantiated? Maybe you're running on the cloud, maybe you're running in your own data center. And this is a place where automation from tools like Chef actually start to help out. So it can automatic, Chef can automatically be configured to stand up a new environment for you, take that code that you've just built and put it into that new environment. And from there, 
what you probably do is have a product owner come in and look at that change. So another human comes in and says, hey, is this thing ready to put in, in, in place of our customers, ready to go out to our customers? And if so, then they should be able to just, with the click of a button, click a button and move that code through to your production environment where your uh, customers can actually put their hands on it. Now, as it, uh, as it sort of progresses from click that button to in the hands of your customers, there are probably lots of other automated tests that have to get run to make sure and, and to validate that the thing is going to work the way you expect when you get into production. I think that leads uh, perfectly into my next question, which is you. I think you, you did a very good job kind of explaining, is it taking it from, on, as you said, on my machine, on on the developer's machine, to to the production environment. And you mentioned that Chef can help you do that. We wanted to talk about Chef, so I think that's perfect for right now. Tell us what Chef is. Yeah, sure. So Chef is an open source framework that allows for the automation of your infrastructure. Uh, and more specifically, we kind of talk about Chef in terms of managing your infrastructure as code. So the same way that you manage uh, your applications as code, we want to take those same practices and bring them to our infrastructure. Now, when I say infrastructure, um, let me just define what infrastructure means also, right? So infrastructure are the servers or the components on which your applications actually run in your various environments, whether that environment be your development environment, your staging or test environment, all the way through to production. And so that environment, in some instances, may be as simple as a single laptop that sits in front of you. It may be as complex as a, a, a multi-location data center. Uh, or many data centers across multiple locations. It may be something like the cloud, think AWS or, or um, Azure or something like that. But Chef helps you to sort of automate the configuration and provisioning and sort of uh, lo over, over time uh, configuration management for all of those components. And so to think about it kind of simply from, from your development experience, right? So um, if you were, say, to develop in Rails, locally on your laptop, right? How do you get started with that? Well, you need to install a database, you need to install Rails and all of its required gems, you probably have to install some Node get to go in there, um, and since you're doing Rails, like there's probably some Redis or some Q, something, like there's all these different components that you have to sit down and it's likely that you go to a wiki within, like an internal wiki at your company that says, hey, developer, welcome to the team, Follow the page. Follow the four pages in this wiki, and at the end of that, you're ready to start working on our project. Well, the idea behind Chef is we take those four pages of those wikis and we automate it all down completely. So now, as a developer, hey, welcome to the team. Run this Chef recipe, and at the end, your machine will be configured. It's the same way that we configure our staging environments. It's the same way we configure our production environments. So we know with confidence that as you move closer to production, things are going to continue to work. Well, that sounds really good. So kind of how easy is it to get up and running with Chef for somebody that doesn't have that much DevOps experience? Yeah, sure. So uh, really the answer there is it depends. Uh, Chef itself, um, as I mentioned, you write recipes in Chef. Uh, Chef itself, then when you're writing those recipes, you're actually writing Ruby code. Um, and Chef kind of puts a DSL or a domain-specific language on top of that Ruby code. So while you're writing Ruby, it's really Chef flavored Ruby, if you will. Uh, so you're doing things like describing packages that you need to have installed or describing services that need to be running. And so to get up and running, uh, it, is it easy? Is it hard? It really depends on how complex your application mm -hmm. is, right? And so if your application is a very simple application, it will be easier to get that up and configured and running. And if it, the more complex and the more components that you have, of course, then the more complex your recipes are going to be and so forth. So you just mentioned uh, recipes again. So uh, Chef has, very clever, by the way, um, I'm assuming this was all your idea. Um, but so Chef has something called recipes and uh, cookbooks as well, right? That's can correct. You, can, can you explain what recipes and cookbooks are? Yeah, I certainly can. So a recipe is really a, a set of instructions or a set of uh, what we call resources. If we take it down, uh, these maybe should have been called ingredients. So like, let's start with the ingredients. So an ingredient or a resource in, in the chef parlance is a, a piece of your system and it's a description of a piece of your system and its desired state. 
So as an example, let's say you are running a, a web application and you want Nginx to be the web server that fronts that. So you have a resource called the Nginx package that you need to have installed. You have a service called Nginx that should be running. Each of these are two distinct resources, and with Chef, you just declare the desired state of those resources. So for the package, it should be installed. For the service, it should be running. So a recipe really is a collection of different resources. And so you'll put into that recipe those two different resources. Now, within, uh, with those recipes, you actually package them up into a cookbook. So you can think of a cookbook kind of as like a gem or an MPM package. It's a way to package up and distribute these bits of functionality and to share them with other developers. So in my recipe, I may say I want to install Nginx, but perhaps there's a, an attribute, which is a piece of data that describes the version of Nginx that I want to install. So if I abstract that version number out into an attribute, I can now change the data without having to change the control flow. So from a web development perspective, you can really think of it like an MVC, where you have your model is sort of your data attributes. Install this version of Nginx, deploy this version of my application, and your view is going to be, um, well, sorry, your, your um, uh, controller is going to be the recipe. So these are the resources that we need on the system. And then your view might actually be your templates. So when I install Nginx, I also have to write out an Nginx conf file to describe how Nginx should run. That's kind of your view, and we have that as a template. And both the template and the data attributes and the recipe will all be bundled up into that cookbook itself. And then the cookbook also has another file that's called the metadata file. It's kind of like your manifest. So it will say, this is the Nginx cookbook. This cookbook has a version of 1.0, uh, and, and things like that. Really nice naming convention. Um, you mentioned earlier that obviously the developer on their on their machine should be, um, you know, doing linting and and uh, you know, testing and things like that. Now I imagine a lot a lot of front end developers be using things like uh, like gulp and grunt um, and those kind of things to do those kind of things. So is that something that you have to duplicate to run in Chef? Is that sh something you should do in Chef instead? Kind of how does that kind of story work? How do they fit together? Yeah, so I think that as, as you're moving your application you know, from the, the laptop out into the production environment, you should be writing the appropriate tests for the different frameworks that you're running. So in the Chef world, uh, as part of the community, we actually have a number of different test frameworks that are also pretty cleverly named. So as an example, if you want to lint your Chef recipes, we have a linter called Food Critic. Uh, and it will look at the recipes to make sure that you're following sort of the standard conventions that are agreed upon within the community. Uh, of course, Chef is written in Ruby, so you might also use RuboCop, which is kind of a common Ruby uh, syntax checker. Uh, and then we also have a unit test uh, framework that's built on top of RSpec called ChefSpec, which again can look at uh, the various resources that you've written out, follow that branching logic, and do all of the unit testing there for you. Okay, cool. Yeah, and then as you get closer to production, there's a there's another interesting tool within the Chef ecosystem called Test Kitchen. And what Test Kitchen will allow you to do is actually take the recipes that you have and spawn virtual machines or cloud instances, take those recipes and run them on those uh, newly created instances, and then you can do some integration testing or some functional testing after the fact. So the unit testing, you're not actually doing what we call a converge, where you're not actually installing Nginx, but you do want to go and install Nginx somewhere and make sure that it works the way you expect. And that somewhere should probably not be your production environment. Hence, Test Kitchen comes in and gives us a nice test harness to spin up virtual machines or to spin up cloud instances, apply our chef code there, and, and, and then run some uh, sort of post-convergence testing on that code. Cool. Awesome. Uh, Go ahead, Liam. Sorry, just one quick question. So uh, it looks like um, Chef kind of offers like multiple products, so obviously there's a chef server, but it also seems like there's chef delivery and inspec as well. Um, could you just kind of clarify what those are a little bit? Yeah, sure. I'll talk about sort of some of the various projects uh, that chef 
maintains and offers. So at, at the open source framework level, there are actually three different projects that we're maintaining. The first is Chef itself. So there you can run the Chef server and then have the Chef client itself, and both of those are open source. The, the way that those two work is the server is really responsible for managing or, or hosting all of your cookbooks and then distributing those out to the nodes or the various servers within your environment. And then on each one of those nodes is a tool called the Chef client that executes. And in a typical fashion, the Chef client will execute every, I don't know, let's say 30 minutes every 30 minutes and it will check in with the chef server and say, hey, what's my policy? Am I a web server? Am I a database server? It will download the necessary cookbooks or any changes to the required cookbooks and then it will apply those cookbooks locally. And we do this in a loop. We run it every 30 minutes or so so that we can prevent configuration drift. So uh, there's actually a couple of reasons that we would do it. One is to prevent configuration drift. And by configuration drift, I mean that maybe you've set up your policy and you've captured that in your recipes and you've provisioned the machine and it's done. It's totally working. But then someone on the sysadmin team or the operations team logs into that machine and makes a change to the machine itself, so manually makes a change. Well, that change may have taken that server out of its defined policy. So by running the chef client every 30 minutes, we can ensure that it stays within policy. So we'll uh, roll back or revert those changes, make sure that we bring that server into its proper state. Now, the other reason that we run the chef client every 30 minutes or so is over time your policy changes. The policy of what your infrastructure should look like is never static, just like your applications are never static, right? So as those things change, we can simply change the up or publish the updated policy to the chef server and then within the next 30 minutes, the nodes in my organization will download those up updated policies and apply them locally. So that's kind of, uh, and then I guess the other thing I'll say is that the way that Chef works, right, um, when, when I said earlier that the Nginx package should be installed and the Nginx service should be running, Chef works in, a, in this loop that I call test and repair. It will test the system first. Is Nginx installed? If it is, I'll take no action. If it's not installed, I'll do whatever is necessary to install Nginx, and then likewise with the service. And this way we can run that process every 30 minutes, and if nothing has changed in our policy or on our machine since the last time we ran, we don't make any additional changes. So that's kind of Chef. That's one open source project that we have. The next open source project that we have that we should talk about is InSpec. So InSpec really is, uh, it, ha it kind of has two different roles. One role is it's an integration or a functional testing framework that you can execute inspect tests on your infrastructure after it's been configured. And with inspect, we don't actually care how that node or how that server was configured. It could have been configured with Chef, it could have been configured with Puppet, it could have been configured by hand, none of that matters. We just want to do some validation that it meets our functional requirements or our integration requirements. And so you can actually run inspect for that. The other reason or the other purpose of inspect is actually looking at some of your compliance controls. So I'm sure at your companies you've been visited by auditors from time to time and maybe as front end web devs, like you don't actually interact with those auditors very often. And if so, good on you, like that's lucky. Uh, but there are others in your organization who maybe for two weeks' time will say, sorry, we can't do any changes to our environment because the auditors are here and we have to prove that we're, you know, running secure systems. Well, Inspect can actually be used to write some of those compliance tests for you so that when the auditor shows up, you can just say, look, here's my Inspect tests. They've been running every 30 minutes every day uh, over time, and so you can see that we've stayed in compliance. And the third open source project that we have is a brand new one called Habitat. And Habitat is, uh, like, we could do a whole episode on Habitat, so I'll, I'll just touch on it briefly, and you can ask whatever questions you like. But Habitat itself is uh, this idea that the applications themselves should have, will have some automation built directly in them. And so Habitat provides that application automation. And really, when we talk about application automation, we're, what we're talking about is how do you build, manage, and deploy your applications to the production environment. And we want to make that sort of as easy as possible, and that's where Habitat comes in. Now, you also mentioned Chef Delivery. Uh, so that the, those three projects that I just talked about, Chef, uh, Inspec, and Habitat, are all free and open source projects. 
On top of that, we do have some commercial offerings. And the commercial offerings specifically are around uh, a couple of different things. One is the workflow. So how does the code in your organization move from that development laptop all the way out to production? Chef Delivery provides a, 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 a well-known workflow to sort of automate that entire process. The next uh, commercial product that we have is called Chef Compliance. And so Chef Compliance builds on top of InSpec and says, okay, well, if we're going to run these InSpec tests to help keep our auditors happy, how do we actually do that in, a, in an automated way? How do we build reports around that and so forth? And that's where Chef Compliance comes in. And then the third one is going to be uh, a tool that provides visibility across all of your infrastructure. So you can see, like, what's happening, who's uploaded cookbooks that have changed, which nodes have changed resources on them, what's the current state of those nodes, and so forth. So, whew, that's all of the Chef projects. Uh, uh, I hope that was a, I mean, I know that was a long-winded answer for what seemed to be a pretty simple question. No, oh, brilliant. Thank you. Yeah, no, that, that, that's perfect. Um, I'm a little disappointed that um, they don't all seem to follow the naming convention um, as, <laughs> as closely as, rec as recipes and cookbooks, but um, I think we could probably uh, forgive that. Um, so one question that I did have about, so... Um, auditors is what made me look through the list and, and, and find it. So um, I've done some federal contracting in my uh, in my life, and so there so there's a lot of um, say rules. There's a lot of rules that you have to follow to make a lot of that stuff happen. And so something like the the, the inspec, I believe, is is sounds like it's something that is helpful for some of those things. Another big part is, um, and I'm actually kind of surprised we didn't ask this before. Is Chef a cloud solution, or is Chef something where I can take it and I can run it on-premise, and I can run my own instances of Chef and don't have to deal, that could be in the government, a lot of it, they want it completely isolated, they don't want it out in the uh, the cloud for, for good and for bad, so they have some good reasons for that and some not good reasons, but so is it something that I could take and I could run this on-premises? Yeah, for sure, that's a great question. So. Uh, you have a bunch of different options there. So when we talk about the Chef server itself, uh, you can either run that yourself in your, on your own premise, where, wherever the, that on-premise may be, whether that's in a cloud or in a data center or on a laptop or a desktop underneath your desk. Uh, and I hope that that's not production, but the, I'm not an auditor, so I won't ask that question. Uh, <laughs> and then, uh, so that's where you can run the Chef server. Uh, we also, as a company, offer uh, Hosted Chef, which is basically Chef Server as a service. So you can subscribe to that and then just let us manage the Chef Server for you. Now, when it comes to uh, Chef Server, you also can go into, say, the Amazon Marketplace or the Azure Marketplace, and there's a pre-baked AMI. So you can just go into the Marketplace and just say, I want a Chef Server, and, and launch that up. Uh, of course, you can run it all on your own or through any of those options. Now, with uh, Chef Compliance, again, in the marketplace, you can grab a Chef Compliance server. We don't offer Chef Compliance as a, as a software as a service platform, so you will definitely be running Chef Compliance on your own. And then the same is true for de Chef Delivery. So you'll run that either in your own cloud or on your own premise. We don't offer that as a service. So it's kind of a mix, but the, the general, like, basic Chef stuff, you really have a bunch of different deployment options for you. Cool. Um, so while we're still talking about the different chef offerings, etc., um, obviously it sounds like Chef's really designed for you know teams and collaboration, and those kind of things. But is there anything that Chef can offer for you know one band band who's you know building apps and stuff like that? Is is there anything kind of there for those kind of people? Yeah, for sure. So I think that uh, if if you are the single operations person within an organization, uh, you are responsible for building and maintaining a, a lot of infrastructure. Having something like Chef can ensure that it that infrastructure gets built in a consistent and repeatable fashion. Uh, and the idea that uh, like honestly, Chef becomes helpful when you have uh, when n is greater than one. So when you have more than one machine on which to deploy or which to configure, and and if we're being frank and honest, uh, even if you are a one man shop, like you are the only employee at that organization and are building an application, it's likely that you have n greater than one number of servers that you need to configure, right? And the the um like. So if we go back in my history, right, the, the, the first time I became a sysadmin, what I did and was really good at was copying and pasting. 
I could copy and paste commands out of the shell and into a wiki, and then I could copy commands out of the wiki and paste them into a shell. And it felt really good to do that because I knew every time I pasted into the wiki that the next time I needed to configure a machine like that, I'd be able to do so. The problem was it was usually, you know, a couple of months <coughs> go by, and then I have to configure a new machine. I paste all the commands, and the machine doesn't work. And so now here I am. I followed the exact same procedure as before, and it's just not working. Uh, how do I solve for that? So something like Chef can absolutely solve for that because you're capturing not documentation, which uh, I don't know about you front-end devs, but uh, a lot of people updating documentation, like it's not, it's not their jam, right? <laughs> So instead, literally my of, favorite part of the job. I, 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 I figured it probably would be, but <laughs> instead of updating documentation, what if you updated the code and just executed the code, and that's how your infrastructure came into being and was configured? Now every time I have a change, I change the code, uh, and and um, like the beautiful beautiful thing about that is that every time I have a change, the way that change starts is in my version control system. Right? It doesn't start by me logging into a production system, making a change, and see what happens, right? which we've all done before. Well, maybe not all of us. I'm sure neither of you have done that before. Uh, why would you ever just change something in production and see what happens? But uh, yeah, there are definitely people out there that still do that. Hopefully they're listening to the show and are, are getting some good tips here. For sure. It's a, it's a dangerous game you play there. Um, <laughs> I, I actually I actually almost uh, think it might have to be a rite of passage at some point that at some point you just have to SSH into a server, pull up nano, and just just to change that one if statement that didn't get caught somewhere correctly as you are very carefully typing pressing one key at a time. <laughs> That's right. And just make sure you copy that file to same file name dot BAK before you do that in case you mess up so you can copy it back. <laughs> For sure. Um so I kind of have a two part question. Um, now, um, and a lot of this is based off of what Leon said. So, a lot of you know, talking about one, one person shops or even open source projects, I think is a good example. So, for a, a lot of people are used to going to a GitHub page and seeing the little badge, right? The little um, uh, you know, like Circle CI or Travis or something like that, and that seems to be the the default, kind of the default. I like Circle. I know a lot of people like Travis, but. Uh, when you're doing something open source, it's very easy. You get the nice little badges for free. The, the integration is it's very seamless. Most of the times, you just have to log in with your GitHub account, and it will just work. So for people working on open source projects, are there, do you think Chef is a fit for some of the, or Chef or some of the other offerings are a fit for some of those open source projects? And then the second part is not open source, but very, sm but very small companies that maybe can't hire a DevOps guy. To configure a lot of this stuff, is Chef, um, uh, Leon earlier asked about how easy it is to set it up, is it something that somebody, not even just easy, is it something that someone without a DevOps background can, can do for both open source and then for just a small company? Sure. Is it something, is it within the grasp of mere mortals, right? Uh, yes, absolutely. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, a couple part question. I'll give you a couple part answer, and hopefully I'll hit on all of the things. So first, Circle and Travis, man, I love them both, and they're they're incredible, and the, neither one is meant to replace Chef, and nor is Chef meant to replace either one of those. In fact, with all of our open source projects, we use Travis quite heavily. Uh, so you'll see if you go and look at our open source cookbooks or the Chef client itself, you'll see that it will have a Travis badge on it on, in its readme itself. So I think that um, you know that that sort of uh, the the beauty of of those tools really and, and where they're sort of focused is on how do you do that continuous testing and some of that continuous integration. That's where those tools really shine. Uh, so Chef is different in that uh, in that it's going to actually build and and manage a, say a production environment for you. So from an open source project, like would you use Travis or would you use Chef? The answer is you would definitely use Travis or Circle or something like that. And then the question turns around to like, are you building and deploying the application that you're building? Or is it simply a library that like other developers are going to consume? If it's a library that other developers are going to consume, then it's probably not something that you would like stand up production infrastructure for. But if it's an application or a website or something along these lines that is an open source project, 
then yes, you would probably use Chef to deploy that infrastructure on which that application is going to live. So it really comes down to the question of, is there infrastructure behind this that's not, you know, that where the application is going to run? If so, then Chef or a tool of its ilk could absolutely be used to build and manage that infrastructure. Um, I think there was another part to the question that I've forgotten, so you'll have to remind me. <laughs> yeah, so um, so open source, open source um, and is Chef something that could be used there? Um, answer that. So the other part was about just a, a, a very small team or if you work for, if you're in a startup, you have a small company, you don't have the money to pay a DevOps guy. Is this something that, uh, in the realm of mere mortals, I believe, as you put it. Right, right, right. So first, um, I'm sure when you say DevOps guy, you mean DevOps human, um, and it's not a gender. Yes, yes, thing. absolutely. I mean DevOps human, of course. <laughs> All right, awesome. Uh, I mean, you could hire a DevOps robot or a DevOps alien too, but they're much harder. To, I mean, it's hard enough to find a DevOps human. I don't think you should go for the others, uh, especially if you're a small team. So, uh, so then the the question really becomes like, I, I need to understand a little bit more about how complex your application is and whether or not it's it, it's worth you investing in that. So sometimes your application or your team are small enough that a deployment platform like Heroku might make sense, right? And with Heroku, you're not the one that's managing the infrastructure. Someone else is managing that infrastructure. And de deploying your application can be as easy as like a Git push Heroku. That's really great because it does get your application in front of customers, especially as you're getting started, where you can get some feedback, right? And DevOps is a lot about compressing those feedback cycles. So how can we get change out to our customers faster, get feedback on that? The problem with a platform like Heroku is that sometimes you just, you simply outgrow it, right? A platform like that that allows for such easy deployments also puts some constraints on your applications. Now we can argue whether those constraints are good or bad, and maybe in the early stages of your organization or of your application, those constraints are super good because they keep you totally focused on what's the customer value that I'm building. But over time, those solutions might become too expensive, the constraints might become too strict, and you find that you need to move outside of those constraints. And that's where you might need to start running your own infrastructure. And at that point, you're definitely going to want someone on the team who has uh, some capability, some specialization in how do I run my own infrastructure? What does operations actually look like? And DevOps, just to go back to the term, right, uh, and I have see a lot of sort of uh, FUD or fear, uncertainty, and doubt around this, DevOps does not mean that every developer needs to become an operations person. Right? Uh, it's, it's not about just blending the two roles into one. It is about having some specialization. I think specialization is still super important for you to have. It's more about working together. So I hope that answers the question, but uh, obviously yes. you'll ask me more if there are. <laughs> yeah, no, that was, that was perfect. Thank you. Um, so I've got another question. So we've started to kind of compare, you know, uh, Chef to a few other things like uh, Travis and, and Circle and stuff like that. Um, and it's great because it adds a bit more clarity for people that aren't exactly clear on kind of what's going on. So um, so at the minute, the, the container uh, kind of tool suites, you know, like Docker and stuff are kind of really kind of hot and exciting at the moment. Is Does that come into Chef in any way? Is that something that you can use Chef to work with or the kind of completely different kind of things that you don't really... Uh, see kind of integrating with? Yeah, no, I think that, uh, you know, when it comes to containers, <coughs> excuse me, you have solutions like Docker, like Rocket, and so forth, and then you have other tooling within that sort of container ecosystem, things like Kubernetes and Mesosphere, things like this. I think that Chef actually makes all of them a little bit better uh, and makes it easier to run them. If you think about j just Docker, right, you want to put your application into a Docker container and you want to go and run that Docker container somewhere or that set of Docker containers somewhere. First, that set of Docker containers lives on a set of infrastructure. So somehow the Docker daemon needs to be or the Docker process needs to be installed there. And there's some configuration that needs to happen on that machine where those Docker containers run. So Chef can handle all of that for you. But then also when it comes, and that same can be said for like, how do you stand up your Kubernetes cluster or your Mesosphere cluster or your X tool in that ecosystem? Like Chef can manage the deployment and management of those underlying systems onto which you deploy those containers. But then we also start to look at the other uh, open source project that I mentioned, Habitat. So Habitat is really a way for you to take your applications and put them into a new package format 
and then deploy those applications, build, manage, and run those applications. And so Habitat actually offers to Docker and, and, and makes Docker a little bit better to run in production because it offers things like service discovery uh, has been built into Habitat itself. So with service discovery, maybe you're a load balancer container, like a, I don't know, an HA proxy or something like this, and you need to pass load back to a number of web servers that sit behind you. So that service discovery bit, which web servers should I pass load to, that is built directly into Habitat. Uh, or if you're an application server and need to find the database that you should talk to, that's, again, that's service discovery that's built directly in. The other thing that, um, that Habitat provides for you is this idea of topology awareness. And so when we talk about topology, think about like running a cluster of databases. Sometimes in that cluster, you have to have leader elections. So I'm going to be the leader. The two of you will be followers and synchronize data off of me. And should I fail, one of you can take over as leader. That whole leader election and that topology is handled by Habitat. So there are, uh, and then <laughs> the third thing that Habitat also gives you is an update strategy. So if I have a new version of the application and, and the three of us are both running that application, how should we update? Should we do one at a time? Should we all update the application at once? Should we do like a canary deploy where we deploy to one of us and see like, uh-oh, Leon fell over. We better not deploy this any further because poor Leon is, mm, sorry, Leon, about your demise, uh, right? So this is what Habitat adds into that. And so with that, you, you can run Habitats themselves, uh, these applications, in Docker containers. You can run them on bare metal. You can run them in cloud instances. But having that extra sort of operability uh, or that extra management in your Docker containers uh, is something that Habitat really brings. Cool. Thank you. Very cool. Yeah, very cool. So I have a very... Um, Kind of just, I'm very lazy when it comes to a lot of this stuff. Um, is there like a uh, like a, a plugin ecosystem or something like that for Chef? So specifically, I'm thinking about things of you know, like I know I want to deploy to, I know I'm going to deploy to AWS or something like that, and I don't want to really do anything. I want to click, I want to install something that will now employ to fill out a little config and it will then deploy to my AWS instance. Um, does Chef handle some of that stuff on its own or is there a, a community, like a community run set of plugins or something like that? Yeah, so that's part of the, um, part of the beauty of Chef is sort of the community that's built the ecosystem around Chef. So there are a couple of different things when you, when you talk about plugins and, and what other tooling is available to you. So one of the tools that we use all the time with Chef is a tool called Knife. So every good chef has a, has a strong knife, right? So with Knife, Knife itself is actually a tool that you will use to interact with the chef server. And as you interact with the chef server, you might do things like publish your cookbooks, publish cookbooks that have been written and tested and you're ready to publish new versions of those cookbooks. But you'll also use it to, say, provision new instances that are part of your infrastructure. So if you want to provision a new uh, um, instance on AWS, there's actually a Knife EC2 plugin. So you would run a command that's like Knife EC2 server create, and you would tell it what cookbooks to run and what AMI to use as the base AMI. And at the end of that, you have a database server, or at the end of that, you have a web server, or what have you. And so Knife itself has, a, 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 I don't know, hundreds of plugins. So you can use Knife with AWS, you can use it with uh, Google's platform, you can use it with OpenStack, you can use it with VMware, you can use it with Azure, wherever you're deploying infrastructure, Knife will work with that. The other bit of uh, sort of plug-in capability that you have within the Chef community, the other big one, is this idea of shared cookbooks. So within the Chef ecosystem, we have a website called supermarket.chef.io, and from the supermarket, you can go and get a bunch of cookbooks. So let's say you wanted a cookbook to deploy MySQL. Um, you could go to the supermarket, find the MySQL cookbook, download that, and run it. Uh, of course, I would advise against downloading that and running it in production. Although, you know, who has ever run into any problems with going to the Internet, grabbing some random person's code, and running it in their production system? It's probably fine. You should. Probably I, believe the, I believe the data says that that is what you should do. Yeah, I'm pretty sure. I'm pretty sure the data is right when it comes to that. So you should totally do that. Uh, to be clear to everyone listening, we are being totally sarcastic here. You should never, <laughs> never, never 
just grab something off the internet and run it in your production environment. But uh, those cookbooks on the supermarket do give you sort of a leg up or a step in to how do I actually manage this particular bit of functionality or this application or this piece of software with Chef. Now the other quick thing I'll just say about those cookbooks on the supermarket, um, the beautiful thing about them is that they're shared with our community and so you can look around the community to others that have solved this problem and the best way to use those honestly in my opinion is to use those as reading material, right? You get to become a better author, a better coder by reading more code, not necessarily writing more code. I think you'll learn from many different authors of code how they approach it. Uh, or attack a particular problem. So go and use those cookbooks as a great library of reading material for yourself. And then maybe some of them will work directly for you. Others maybe will do more than you need, but uh, you can extract ideas and patterns from those cookbooks. And I think that's the important bit. You touched on community quite a bit there, and obviously community is really important for any kind of open source project. Um, the first thing I'll do when I'm thinking about using kind of a, an open source tool or whatever is go on the GitHub page. Um, so just to give listeners an idea, I'm on the GitHub page for Chef at the minute, there's um, 4,322 stars, there's nearly 17,000 commits, um, and 1,801 forks. So you can see it's obviously a very active project, you know, the the uh, the contributions bars like deep red <laughs> so there's a lot going on there which is really good to see <laughs> yeah we we take it very seriously and in fact we have many uh, or we have a number of members that are not employed by my employer by chef software that have direct commit access to a lot of those open source repositories so uh, yeah. if you're if you're one of the committers uh, you actually can go ahead and commit directly to master you can merge changes in and so forth we have a, a pretty good governance structure and, and a, a process around how you can become a committer or how you can become a maintainer of Chef's projects. We have a weekly meeting that we host in IRC with all of those folks, all of those maintainers, and an RFC process to talk about like what's the next thing, what's the next piece of feature or functionality that we should add to Chef or the change that we want to make. Uh, and both Chef the company and any external community contributors follow that same process. So if Chef, the company, wants to make a sweeping change to the way the project works, we, we can only do so through the uh, RFC process. That's pretty cool. I, th and I think that's very important as well. Leon was saying how it's you know, very open. Having community contributions is very important, and there are not uh, you know many worse ways to, to affect it to directly affect the community if the company in charge, I mean, we've seen examples of this, the company in charge that, like, kind of pulls the rug out from under people. Um, so that can be, it, it's very, I think it's very awesome, I think it's very awesome that you guys are doing it that way. Um, we are starting to run out of time. We have about, we have about 10 minutes left. Um, one of the last things I wanted to ask was if you knew of any, like really solid examples of somebody either not specifically using Chef, just like really good DevOps processes from from companies that are out there. And I mean, obviously, you could say like you know, I'm sure Google and Netflix and such have have are do a decent job at getting their stuff out. Um, but if there are any other or or person any anything anything that somebody can go to and be like, okay, this is how this organization is getting things from getting things from development to in production for everyone to see. Yeah, for sure. So first, I think, you know, you mentioned Google and Netflix and Facebook is uh, one of our big customers. Um, but uh, unless you work at Google or Netflix or Facebook, like, you're going to listen to how they do things and probably think to yourself, well, none of that really applies to me. And if we actually go back to my definition of DevOps, like, the last phrase in that definition was it's born from the experience of its practitioners. Uh, so the way that Facebook practices DevOps, totally different than the way that Google does and way different than you will also. So I think the best thing to do if you want to get started and look for uh, ideas from people that are from similar size companies or companies in a similar industry to what you're in, I think uh, there's a couple of really great options. First, within the DevOps community, we have uh, this uh, program or this conference that we run on a pretty regular basis called DevOps Days. Uh, and DevOps Days, uh, you can find on devopsdays.org. 
They happen around the world. And if you go to that site, you'll see that there's likely one happening or recently happened in your neighborhood, uh, but one coming up. And this is a place where we actually, the, the, the format of the conference is this. There's mornings of keynote presentations, but then the afternoon is all open spaces. And so with open spaces, the idea behind that is there is no agenda as you start, and you make up the agenda with the participants that are there. So you get the best opportunity to talk about the things that are most important to you. And so I think going to uh, a DevOps Days uh, event or going to a meetup around DevOps is a really good way for you to meet someone potentially local to you, someone that you can sit down and share ideas with, someone that you can make good connections with. So I think that that's really the best place for you to start if, if what you're doing is trying to find inspiration and ideas for DevOps. Of course, there are lots of podcasts as well that you can listen to. Uh, the Food Fight Show, which I mentioned at the beginning of the show, I feel you know I should mention that again since that's the show that I am part of, but there's uh, other shows like Arrested DevOps, The DevOps Cafe, The Ship Show. These are all great talks uh, um, or great podcasts that you can listen to for some inspiration, and you'll hear sort of case studies from folks like Nordstrom or Target or uh, you know, any other company or industry that you're interested in uh, that might help you. Excellent. Well, we are, uh, we're just about out of time. So, um, one, Nathan, just thank you very much for being on. Do you have any like, final parting words of wisdom for, uh, for us and for, for anybody listening? Yeah, sure. I'll say that, look, DevOps is uh, it's an oft misunderstood term. I think, and I hope that over the course of this last hour, we've helped you get a better understanding of what DevOps is. If you're just getting started on your DevOps journey, I will say that it's going to be hard. It's not, it's not an easy thing, but you are smart enough and strong enough to make it through this journey. Uh, there's a huge community of people that are out here willing and able to help you out. Uh, so I encourage you to reach out to the community. People out here will help you are interested in talking with you, can share with you the pitfalls that they've gone through, some of the learnings that they've gone through, and can help you through this journey. Uh, you're you're going to be just fine. It's not going to happen overnight. Perfect. I, I don't know if you could have said it any better. Yeah, very wise words. <laughs> um, well, uh, Nathan, if people want to get in touch with you, if they want to learn more about Chef, more about DevOps in general, um, how can they get in touch? Yeah, sure. The best way to reach me uh, directly is on Twitter, uh, and there my handle is Nathan Harvey, but I must warn you, my father misspelled my name, uh, so it's N-A-T-H-E-N-H-A-R-V-E-Y, uh, unlike most Nathans that you know. So that's definitely the best way to reach out to me, and I'm happy to take any questions that you have on Chef, on DevOps, uh, on anything that we've talked about today. Awesome. Well, again, uh, thank you very, very much. And this has been episode 96 of the Web Platform Podcast. Podcast? Podcasts? I'm imagining you're something different. We talked all about DevOps and Chef. Uh, Nathan, thank you again. Leon, thank you as always. And we will talk to everybody next week. Thanks for having me. I really enjoyed it. Brilliant. Thank you. You want to learn more about what's coming on next on the Web Platform Podcast? Follow us on Twitter at, at the Web Platform or on Google Plus and YouTube at Plus the Web Platform. We also need your help in creating transcripts of the episodes and helping to create open source projects under our GitHub organization. Contact Eric Isaacson at E. Isaacson or Danny Blue at D underscore Blue. That's D-E-E -E underscore B-L-O-O. -O. Thank you for listening, everybody, and we'll catch you all next week. <laughs>